Well, you might not know it by looking around, but our women are uh, away at a women's retreat. In fact, uh, Michelle sent me a picture. There they are. Keep that up for a second. But uh, we have a bunch of women out down at 30A, and they're doing uh, just an incredible time of study and God's Word, sharing, and it's been super, super encouraging uh, for them. And I say that to also encourage you, all the guys in here, that we also have a retreat coming up here in a few weeks. And I was watching a John Chris video that Mitch sent me, and it reminded me a little bit about uh, the difference between men and women when it comes to these retreat things. So roll that clip for us, will you? You can't even say the word women's retreat and it's already sold out. Just women's retreat, sold out. <laughs> they don't care who's going, what the itinerary is, what we're gonna, we deserve it, we gotta go. <laughs> There's been a men's retreat on sale at your church for a year and a half, okay? <laughs> Four guys are going, they work at the church. <laughs> you can't even say the word women's retreat and it's already sold okay. out. Just women's retreat. I don't know why it's doing out. that again, but yeah, there, there we are. So, guys, all right, we got to step it up. All right, there's a few more than four signed up, but um, honestly, not a whole lot more than that at this point. And so, guys, get your phones out. Go to the next slide. Let me show you how to uh, know, advance one more slide. There we go. Go to your app, and it's a little thing at the bottom that says men. And if you'll click on that, and you can easily sign up for the men's retreat. And also, I've got an arrow pointing over there to where it says the end of the weekend. Because if you'll notice, guys, that we end at 1.15, and Georgia comes on at, anybody know? Three, right. So, so you're good, all right? You're really, you're okay. You'll make it back in time, I promise. There's also, underneath that arrow, it says optional activity. All right, we know most of you will take off before that, right? So I hope you'll sign up and be part of this men's weekend. It's going to be really, really great. And we got some great presenters there from our own group here. You heard from one, Jerry, this morning. If you've, uh, even if you've heard his testimony uh, before, it's worth hearing again. I've heard it three or four times. And every time I'm moved by just his story about how God worked in his life over in Afghanistan and um, just a really, really good stuff. And so that's Friday night, and then we'll be have a couple of different shares on, on Saturday as well. So we're back in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And so if you'll flip there with me, let me pray, and we'll look at this passage of Scripture. Father God, we thank you for your word that just wakes us up out of the fog of life and living and doing the stuff that we have to do. And it wakes us up to how important every task is, that whether we eat or we drink or whatever we do, we can do that for your glory because we're focused on you and the work that you're doing through the Spirit in our lives and our hearts. And God, I pray that today will be an encouragement for each one of us because we all can get caught up in just the day-to-day activities and forget why we're here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So... Michelle and I were about to get married, and of course, we were young, and we were on a very, very tight budget, and so we decided one of the ways we might be able to cut some costs was to hire a non-professional wedding photographer, all right? So this was a guy who worked in the accounting office with Michelle there at the college that I attended. He was an accountant, detail guy, and he started a little gig on the side doing photography for weddings, so we thought, wow, he's a lot cheaper and also, you know, he's a friend, so we'll help him out. All right, so I, I, you would think that a wedding photographer would at least have some kind of list. Like I just Googled and pulled up a list of pictures that you get when you do a wedding. And, I mean, there were great pictures of Michelle with her bridesmaids. There were pictures of me with my groomsmen. There were pictures with our families. There were all kinds of pictures. There was, honestly, there was even a picture of the photographer with Michelle, my bride, Right? Zero, I'm telling you, I'm honest, zero pictures of Michelle and I together after the wedding. None. He totally (laughs) forgot to take any pictures of the bride and groom. All right, I would dare say that's probably the most important job. Like, this is their day, so, like, that's his purpose, right, to document this for the bride and groom. One job, and he missed his job. He missed his purpose. Lest we be too harsh on him, let's be honest, We have one purpose in life, and it's very easy to miss it, not because we're dull and ignorant. Phil is not a dull or ignorant person, but just because we're so busy, we're so caught up in life, we're so just getting from point A to point B, we're so just 
taken up in the moment, or maybe it's apathy that, you know, we've been around the things of God for most of our lives, and it's sort of second nature just to do church and to go through the motions of K-group each week, and we do all these spiritual things, but we forget when we walk into the world, we go out of the doors of our gatherings, that our mission, our job is to point people to Jesus Christ. And I love Paul because Paul is always crystal clear on what his mission and purpose in life is. In fact, if you, if you have your text, your Bible open, flip back to verse 12, which Roy covered last week. But I'm going to just remind you, Paul said this. He says, for our boast, and he's not bragging here. He's just saying, like, hey, Paul loves to use this. I boast in the cross. I boast in Jesus. He says, my boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, so supremely, so in great measure to you, the Corinthians. And so Paul says his, his life, get this, was marked by simplicity. I don't know about you, but sometimes life doesn't feel too simple, right? It feels overwhelming at times. And Paul's not saying that he only did one or two things. We know that's not the case. Paul is saying by this word simplicity, he's single-minded. That regardless of what he's doing, he's single-minded on his purpose, which is Jesus Christ. And then he says, with godly sincerity. He's making the case to the Corinthians that while he does what he does with a single focus, he has integrity, his pure motives. And that's his boast, not in, a, again, a bragging way, but he says, my conscience is clear. Obviously, Paul isn't perfect. He was human just like us. But he could definitively say, this is the reason why I exist. And his life illustrated that, did it not? And he said that it was motivated by the grace of God as opposed to what? as opposed to earthly wisdom. So Paul's single-mindedness and his wholeheartedness was devoted to living for the, by the grace of God for the advancement of the gospel. By the grace of God for the advancement of the gospel. Just simple, focused, sincere. Yesterday, Michelle's out at the retreat, and yesterday, Harrison and I were uh, talking in the living room, and uh, John Piper, the name John Piper came up. Many of you heard us, have heard us talk about Piper. Many of you have listened to his sermons or read some of the things he writes. But I was telling Harrison back in the year 2000 was my first introduction to John Piper. John Piper spoke at this conference that I went to called Passion One Day, and it was in Memphis, Tennessee. It was in a big field. We camped out, and then we went to the big service, and there was like thirty or 40,000 college students there. I went as a leader, took a group of about 20 from Dallas, and it was in Memphis, Tennessee. Amazing time, but when this guy stood up, this guy who, kind of an older man, younger than I am now, um, stood up, and he began to talk. Uh, at first, I thought, why is this guy like up there? And then he began to talk, and I knew why he was up there. And there are so many quotes from that sermon that I could share today, but I wanted to share one quote with you. Piper said this, he said, if you want your life to count, if you want the ripple effect of the pebbles you drop to become waves that reach the ends of the earth and roll on for centuries and into eternity, you don't have to have a high IQ or EQ, you don't have to have good looks or riches, you don't have to come from a fine family or a fine school. You have to know a few great, majestic, unchanging, obvious, simple, glorious things and be set on fire by them. Man, that hit me like a ton of bricks. Not that I had not heard that before, but the way that it was said just hit me in a special way. I don't want to waste my life. I want my life to count for God. I want to be single-minded with one aim and one purpose, and want to live that with integrity and godly sincerity. That was Paul's goal. And if we're going to live that way, listen, let's be honest. We can have that intention, 
we can think about that today, but we can walk out, we can go to lunch. The first time that the server doesn't meet our need and get our drink to the table at the right time, we can complain in our mind or verbally and be like, oh man, just right away, I'm already off task, right? I'm off the point. How do we do it? It's through God's spirit we'll see working in and through us. And it's an awareness of God. I think it's just a, a constant prayer that is in our heads that says, God, enable me today through your grace, through your spirit to live for you. I can't do this. You can do this through me. And the Corinthians, they've missed this point. We've talked about this. You know this. The, the church there is a mess. It's a wreck. I mean, there's tons of sin and just shameful things going on and just selfishness. But here you have Paul single-minded focus. He's risking his life. He's traveling. He's being persecuted. He's starting churches. He's discipling leaders. He's building the kingdom, and he's just, just investing so much in this church in Corinth. And here we go in this text today. They want to criticize him and question his integrity. Why? Because he had to change his plans. He had to change his plans. Look at it, verse 15. Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. I wanted to visit you on my way back from Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. But, I vac- but was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and then no, no at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been Yes and no. So they were worked up because Paul had to change his plans. They were questioning his integrity. They were questioning his love for them and his intentions just in general. And unlike the church at Corinth, Paul was in step with the Spirit. The things that Paul did, the adjustments he had to make, were signs that he was aware of his mission, aware of his purpose, which was the progress of the gospel And that demanded a shift in Paul's itinerary, yet they took it very personally, and they criticized him. And there were some in the church there who were especially critical of Paul. They did not like Paul. They came in and asserted themselves as leaders, super apostles is the word that Paul used. And they wanted to make Paul seem like he was not doing what he had said he was going to do. A little recap for you just on Paul's interactions with the church at Corinth. I think it's helpful to put this in perspective as we're talking about this. It was around 17 years after Jesus uh, was, uh, was crucified that Paul started this church. He, you remember he, he had his experience on the road to Damascus. He came to Jesus. His life just completely 180 change. And then he spent over a year and a half in Corinth seeing people come to Jesus developing these leaders, but he leaves, and there's just these incredible problems and this this selfishness that comes out in these believers. So he writes a letter to them. We don't have a copy of this letter. He writes a letter to them, and then he writes a second letter, which we call 1 Corinthians, and then he makes a quick visit to Corinth, which Paul refers to as his painful visit. Why was it painful? It was painful because these super apostles, these leaders, attacked him, attacked his personality, attacked his character. They attacked him for the way that he was ministering. And they also, um, it was was a very difficult time. They didn't receive what Paul had to say. So Paul leaves, he retreats, he leaves, and then he writes a severe letter to them and also sends Titus to them. And then Paul writes the letter that we have, this book of 2 Corinthians. And so In there, Paul had promised to visit them again twice, in fact. First on his way, uh, when he made his way to Macedonia, and then again on his way back. But he changed his plans, he delayed his visit, deciding to only visit them this one time. And so this led to his opponents to claim that he was unreliable, fickle, deceptive, and he just lacked integrity. But Paul is making his case here, and he's giving them the benefit of the doubt. Look at verse 15, he says, because I, am, I was sure of this, meaning that he was sure that they have learned to trust him, that he's given them the benefit of the doubt, that they can now, like, they, they get it. They understand why Paul did what he did. But again, however, there's some in the church who are rejecting Paul's authority, using this as an occasion to undermine him. 
And so Paul's opponents used his retreat, his leaving from the severe visit, to actually continue to criticize him. But look what Paul says about his plans back in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says this, he says, For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you. And then what does he say next? If the Lord permits. If the Lord permits. That's why he writes in verse 17, Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? So he's saying, look, I, I'm at the leading of the Spirit in these matters. Where the Lord leads me, where he permits, where his will and his desires dictate, Paul says, that's where I go. He says, I don't make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time. So Paul isn't denying that his plans changed. He was, he's telling this he wasn't irresponsible in what he did. He was unable to follow through. And for us, we think, well, what's the big deal? If a missionary says they're coming to visit Grace Church, and then they call and say, uh, change of plans, I mean, we just roll on. We don't think anything about it. But in the ancient world, a couple of things are going on here, you know, that, that you couldn't communicate, you couldn't coordinate schedules like we can today. And then also, you know, there was this underlying agenda that was going on with these false teachers in the church. And so they claimed that Paul had a divided heart. You couldn't trust him. He was saying, yes, out of one side of his mouth, I'm coming to see you. And then on the other side, he's saying, no, I'm not coming to other people. And so Paul's just being hypocritical, a divided heart. And also this idea that Paul didn't love them because, you know, there's more important things for Paul. But obviously, Paul doesn't think we're a priority. He's out there doing other things. But he says, I don't make my plans according to the flesh. What do you, how about you? Do you? I mean, that's a, a great question to turn around on ourselves, me included here. Do I make my plans according to the flesh? Am I self-centered? Am I unreliable? Am I reckless in the things that I say? Do I tell people, yeah, I, I, I want to be a deacon, but then I don't follow through on my commitments, or I'll be there, and then we find every excuse in the world not to come through for this or that project that we're, we've committed to do, or I'll teach that class, and then after two or three weeks, we're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that, right? I, I didn't realize. I didn't take into account what was involved in this. And so we know that things change our agendas, our plans. They do. Sometimes things happen that we just cannot help. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about being sincere and not just saying yes in the moment when the reality is we go back home and think about it and we're like, uh, probably should have been a no, right? We're people pleasers. We're just telling people what they want to hear. And Paul says, look in verse 18, As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. All right? Look what he says here. He doesn't say yes or no. He says yes and no. What does that matter? Well, it's okay to say no to some things, right? Some of you have the problem of saying yes to everything. And they always say, you know, 10% of the people do 90% of the work in the church. We know that's true. And you can get sucked into just being yes all the time. And it's great that people have the capacity to serve and to minister and to use their gifts in a big way. But also, you got to be careful that you're being led by the Spirit in the decisions and the choices that you make. Because overcommitment is a real thing and not being able to simplify your life. And here's some good ways that I gauge when to say no to ministry opportunities that can be really good. How will it impact my discipleship with my family, right? Like, do, do I need to be home in the evenings at times, at least three or four nights a week, in order to minister to them? I mean, I've known many pastors and church leaders who are spending their time, every time there's something going on at the church, ministering to everybody else, but they have no time for their own family. And this is not just about, like, sitting and watching TV, all right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about serving and ministering to our family. And so Paul says, our, 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 we don't say yes and no, or no. We say yes, I'm sorry, or no. We don't say yes and no, double-sided talk. We're not talking out of both sides of our mouth. And I think Paul, as a committed follower of Jesus Christ, I think he thought about the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 37, where Jesus said, let, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. 
What's Jesus talking about there? A disciple of Jesus is to speak the truth in such a way that his yes means yes and his no means no. That's why Jesus said you don't need to throw an oath or a promise on there. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. And so we've all been around unreliable people. We know who they are. Sometimes we may not realize we're that person, right, who is constantly saying yes or, yeah, I think I can do that, but never follow through. That's a character flaw. And so we should be careful to realize that it's easy to point the fingers at other people in these matters, but yet not see our own sin here. So do you speak in such a way that your yes means yes and your no means no? Verse 19, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. So what, Paul, what is Paul talking about there? He says, in Jesus, it's always yes. Paul's saying that he and his gospel partners, that they're committed to the cause of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is always yes. When it comes to the advancement of the gospel, when it comes to Jesus Christ and lifting up Jesus, Jesus is always yes, the gospel is for you. So Paul is making the point here, he's saying that whenever I have an opportunity to advance the gospel, including my time with you, the church at Corinth, and also my intention to get back to you, the church at Corinth, that my answer is yes for the gospel. The gospel always is an emphatic yes, right? Because that's Paul's purpose. So plans change, things come up, but the gospel is what steered his ship, that controlled his agenda. And so Paul's enemies were saying again that we can't trust Paul. We can't trust his promises. We can't trust the things then that he told us about Jesus as well. So they take his change of itinerary, they switch it around and say, look, if Paul can't be trusted about what he says about his schedule, then can we really trust all the other things that Paul has said? And so Paul's saying, not so fast. Don't try to twist the gospel. Don't try to, to twist the message here that I've given you as you assault my character, all right? Don't do it. In fact, look at verse 20. He says, For all the promises of God find their yes in him, which is Jesus. That is why through him we utter our amen to God for his glory. This verse, if we can just like, just leave that on the screen for a second. If we can just, this reminds me of why I say often, and we say often here at Grace Church, it's all about Jesus. Because this verse is all about Jesus. And I love what Charles Spurgeon, you can go to the next slide with this quote with Charles Spurgeon. We might never have had this precious verse if Paul had not been so ill-treated by these men of Corinth. They did him great wrong and caused him much sorrow of heart. Yet you see how evil was overruled by God for good. And through their unsavory gossip and slander, this sweet sentence was pressed out of Paul. I love that. Because this verse is truly amazing. What Paul is saying here, he's saying that at the minimum, at the least, the entire Old Testament message is that God, who makes promises, ultimately fulfills them through the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. That God is yes, yes, while you and I deserved God to look at us and say, no, Jesus allows God to look at us and say, yes, my child. Jesus took our place on that cross so God didn't have to say no, but yes, no, but yes. Jesus fulfills the promises of God. Jesus took God's no so that you could receive God's yes. And you know what? We don't say this around here, but some of you grew up in churches where the pastor says a lot, can I get an amen? That's what Paul says right here. Look at verse 20. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. 
Amen means truly or so be it, but in its most basic form, it means yes. Yeah, right? I, I say, it's all about Jesus, and you say, yes, it is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And in verse 21, 22, Paul gives the Corinthians, I think, some, some real meat to hold on to here in what's going on and what he's saying, this purpose. We know we have this purpose, but how, do, how are we enabled to fulfill this purpose? And so he gives a few things here that I think uh, really can help us as it helped the church at Corinth. First, Paul and the Corinthians are both linked together in union with Christ. Look at verse 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ. All right? So upon, I'll be honest, on first reading of this, this text, some of this stuff is like, what is he saying here, right? I mean, this, this is kind of tricky. But when I studied and studied and studied, it just became crystal clear what he's saying is. He's saying God establishes us, meaning the Corinthians and Paul, together in Christ. So he's making his case the fact that you can trust his sincerity, trust that he is about Jesus, because they, the Holy Spirit, he's going to see in a second, is in, within them, and God is unified them together for Christ, just like God has unified you, if you're a believer, and I together for the cause of Jesus Christ. And so he's building his case, and he's saying that he's changed his itinerary, and, and he's saying yes for the gospel, and they should get this because they're linked together with him through their union with Christ. Paul was the one who brought the gospel to them in the first place. Now they share together in the body of Christ. And he's saying, why would I destroy this union? Why would I try to undermine this connection that we have through together in the union of Christ? So he makes his case that we're in this together. And that's what he says next. He says, and has anointed us. Both Paul and the Corinthians were anointed. They've been tasked with taking the gospel to the world. And while the Corinthians world may have been Corinth, which was a great mission field for them, and Paul traveled around, nevertheless, they were both missionaries, and they were anointed from the Holy, by the Holy Spirit for this task of gospel proclamation. And so if you think back in the Old Testament, when the word anoint was used, a king was anointed, oil literally was pour, poured on them. That's where we get the word anoint. But it was part of a commissioning ceremony for prophets, priests, and kings. And so figuratively, it means that these people, get this, these people, these prophets, priests, kings, were being set apart. We pour oil on them. They're set apart for the work of Christ. They're anointed. Paul says, you're anointed, all of you, all the Corinthians, you're anointed, all right? You're anointed. Paul says, I'm anointed, we're anointed. This is not levels of anointing here. We've been anointed, set apart by Jesus Christ for our purpose, for our mission. We've been linked together with our union with, in Christ. So he's saying, you should understand what I'm doing here and the fact that I'm changing my plans. It's for the good of the gospel. It's for the advancement of Jesus and so we've been anointed. I don't have any more special calling to proclaim the gospel than you do. You've been anointed. And I know that word gets thrown around a lot, and maybe you grew up in a tradition where, you know, oh, they have the anointing of God on them. And I know what they're saying is they're just walking in the Spirit. But the truth is, we're all anointed. We're all anointed. And then verse 22, he goes on, he says, And who, who's talking about God, has put his seal on us, on us, and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So now he says, the Holy Spirit has put a brand on you to show that you belong to God. The Holy Spirit has put his seal on you, has branded you. And so he says this to, again, to the Corinthian church, who's a mess. There's all kinds of problems. But those in the church who were true believers, Paul appeals to them on the basis of who they are in Jesus Christ and the fact that the Holy Spirit lives within them. And I think, and I've said this before, but it's really what changed in my ministry when I recognized the fact that it's not my job to twist your arm to follow the Holy Spirit's guidance. 
I point to the word, I'm passionate about the word, but at the end of the day, the Holy Spirit lives within those of you who are truly believers, and the, the character and the life of Jesus is desiring to work its way out through what Paul calls our members, or our body, or our life, the things that we do and say every single day. And so the Holy Spirit is working on you way more than I can work on you. I get 45 minutes on a Sunday morning, the Holy Spirit's with you 24-7. And he's branded you. So when you go to work, you may hide who you are in Christ, but the Holy Spirit's there if you're a true believer going, you need to show them. You need to shine. You need to allow the, the, the works of Jesus and the life of Jesus to come out practically in your life. Because I've sealed you. I've anointed you. Jesus is within you. And so you can celebrate that. And so Paul says all this, and he's going to continue all this over a change of plans, right? But what incredible truth we get because they protested and they claimed that Paul was not a person of integrity. But Paul says his change of plans happened, but you know what? My purpose is the same, glorifying God through spreading the message of Jesus Christ. And so our application today, here it is. God calls us to simplify our lives for his glory. That's our head. God calls us to simplify our lives for his glory. What are you living for, honestly? That's a tough question. Because we can rub a little Jesus here and there on our lives and feel like we're doing okay. We can make a case. But I would say that the way that we spend our time, where we invest it, are we focused on Jesus in those things that we're investing in, or is that just something we just say, but it's not really true? Our abilities, our gifts, are we using the best of us for the best of others for the advancement of the gospel? And what about our money? What about the, the, our resources? Is God just the, kind of the leftover, like, okay, what do, do we have a, uh, drop 20 in the plate, all right? That's, yeah, we've done our, our duty for the day. That is not the gospel is my whole purpose in life. And this, this is, for those who are in this room who really don't know Jesus, this is silly, right? Why would I give my life for Jesus? I want to get what I want out of this life. I want to enjoy life. I want to have my comforts of life. I want the American dream of life. But those who are true believers, the Holy Spirit's within you right now. The Holy Spirit is encouraging you, prompting you leading you to follow him with greater passion and greater simplicity of focus, single-minded. And we can have good intentions, but we have to walk out of here and do something about it. And that's why we do the heart application, because it starts with our heart. As Jerry said, out of the heart, that's how we live. And so you need to ask yourself and really contemplate, are you living by earthly wisdom or by the Spirit of God? Are you living by earthly wisdom? What's earthly wisdom? Get what you can out of life. It's short. Enjoy it. All right? Live for the weekends. Live for vacations. You know, try your best to make enough in order that you can retire one day and just have an easy, easy life. That's earthly wisdom. And, and, and that's, it, it makes sense at some level, right? It feels good. Because life, we want life to revolve around us. We want to be comfortable. But it's not the way that the Spirit of God leads. Sharing Christ is not comfortable, is it? Living with integrity is not always comfortable, especially if the people you work with don't have integrity. If they're cutting corners and stealing and seeing all the ways they can cheat the IRS to get out of their taxes, and you're, now you're working with them, like, I can't say anything, right? If I say something, then now I might lose my job or they're going to act like I'm an idiot. Like, the smart thing to do is, to, to cheat the system, right? That makes sense. The government doesn't need our money anyway. See, we come up with all these excuses not to live with integrity. That's living with earthly wisdom. So let's, how do we apply this? Remember who you are in Christ 
and follow Jesus, regardless of the cost or criticism. That's what Paul did. Yes, he took a lot of heat for changing his plans, but you know what? He didn't care. It was for the advancement of the gospel. Long time ago, I did a study called Experiencing God, and so much of that course stuck with me, but there's one statement. If you're following along in the app, I included this. It's not going to be on the screen. But Blackaby wrote, he said, you must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he is doing. Once you understand what God is saying to you, you have to make adjustments in your life to follow him. You cannot stay where you are and go with God. Whenever we follow the Spirit's leading through the word, through prayer, it's going to lead us into uncomfortable places. But it's for our joy. In those moments where you obey, I've never heard anybody say, man, I regretted that obedience. I've never heard anybody who's a follower of Jesus regret being obedient. There's been plenty of regret for not being obedient, but no regret for being obedient. Adjust your life to the work of God. Simplify your purpose. Stay focused. Allow the word to work through you through the power of the Spirit. And don't worry about the criticism. God will take care of you. He will. Father God, we thank you for your incredible word. These truths that just awake us to the spiritual realities of life and move us beyond the material existence that we sometimes just find ourselves in, earthly wisdom, to know that there's more. There's this dimension of life that's laying up our treasures in heaven. We don't see that happening, but we believe the promises are yes in Jesus, that that makes sense because Jesus died and rose again and now lives within us. And God, I pray you'll allow us through your spirit this week to truly be willing to go outside our comfort zone in the ways that you call us to in order to advance the gospel, to love others, and make you known. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.